Hello, everyone. We wanted to, although we cannot see you, hopefully you can see us. Again, the chat box is live. Jonathan's monitoring that. This is also streaming via Facebook Live, so you're welcome to share that with friends and colleagues who were not able to join us through this format today. And of course, as indicated in the email, all of this will be shared with you afterwards. We'll be sending out the PDF of the slides so you can share that with your colleagues, as well as a recording of the link on our YouTube channel. So thank you so much for making the time to join us. Right now we have uh, a little over 400 folks on with us. So thank you for making this time again. Um, I just wanna of course request that all mics are muted except for ours. Um, and as we get started, just some brief introductions from all of us. Let me just go ahead and have Jonathan start and we'll take it from there. Yeah. Hi folks, my name is Jonathan Wang. My pronouns are him, his. I currently direct our USC, University of Southern California, Asian Pacific American Student Services. We're one of um, six student equity inclusion programs um, within the Division of Student Affairs um, within USC. And so APAS has been around since 1982. Um, under the leadership of both Sumi and Jade at one point and now um, with me. And so um, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be a part of um, this opportunity to talk with you all. Um, I actually have two degrees from USC as well, my master's in student affairs, also my doctorate in higher education, um, education leadership. So it's a great honor to be here and to be able to talk with all of you. Jade, you wanna jump in? Sure. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Jade Agua. I serve as the Associate Director um, at the USC Race and Equity Center. Uh, looking forward to um, chatting with you all today. Absolutely. And uh, my name is Suman Pendikor. Everyone calls me Sumi, and I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the USC Race and Equity Center. So Jade and I work directly together. We've worked with Jonathan in the past, so this is a family affair on a lot of different levels. Um, I should mention, of course, that all three of us have served Asian American and Pacific Islander students directly through our roles, our for former or current roles at Asian Pacific American Student Services, like Jonathan mentioned. And we also research and publish on Asian American student and community concerns. So this is um, a topic that is both near and dear to our heart and, of course, deeply interconnected to the web and the nexism of how oppression and harm manifest across so many of our communities. Now, we want to be very clear right at the top of this that all forms of racism are intimately interlinked uh, and that they are in constant interplay. But one of the reasons we wanted to do today's workshop virtually is that the manifestations of racism impact each community differently. They play out in different ways. And I think many of us are familiar with that. But for example, if you go to the USC Race and Equity Center's YouTube channel, you'll see the video for the National Town Hall on Black students' needs uh, during the time of COVID facilitated by Dr. Sean Harper um, and a community of others. So uh, this ability to both um, deeply center the specific and nuanced needs of individual communities while also better understanding the ways interconnected forms of oppression impact all of us is pretty key. So I wanted to hang on to that as a guiding thought for the entire time that we have going forward. There's of course space in the chat box to ask questions if you need. We'll be monitoring that throughout. And let me go ahead and share the slides right now. One moment. All right. There we go. So again, you are joining us for a live virtual workshop called Chinese Virus, Why Anti-Asian Racism is So Contagious. Thank you again for making the time to be here with us, not just to be in community, but also to hopefully leave with some concrete ideas, tools, and practices to impact your local community, whether in higher education or other educational sectors. That's really important to us, is what do you actually do with this knowledge? Let's get started. <clears throat> I should mention that if you are live tweeting, if you enjoy that, feel free, go for it. The hashtag is Contagious Racism. We'd appreciate you helping out to build out a back channel for us, for anyone who wasn't able to join us and continue that education in multiple spaces. I wanna mention that we're breaking our time down into three parts. We're gonna first lay out a socio-political and historical framework for how Asians and Asian Americans are positioned in the American racial hierarchy, vis-a-vis -vis one another, but also vis-a-vis -vis two particular constructs. We'll follow that by how these frameworks are playing out in multiple harmful ways during this moment and time of COVID. And we'll close out with concrete recommendations and strategies for institutional, individual, co-curricular and teaching interventions. All right, folks? Keep going. So let's start here. 
<clears throat> some of you have had a chance to read um, the work of Kim, the work of Lee, the work of Jun. That's who we're focusing on a little bit here at this moment. Um, and I wanted to talk about the two different ways that Asian American racial identity in particular is triangulated. One model of that, of course, is how we are triangulated vis-a-vis uh, -vis other communities. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later. In fact, Jonathan's gonna speak about that later on in his section. What I wanna talk about as we set up this framework of understanding a couple of very specific tropes that impact our communities is around this. This is Jane Jun's phenomenal piece called From Cooley to Model Minority, uh, published in 2007 in the Du Bois Review, highly recommended if you haven't had a chance to read it, from Cooley to Model Minority. And she writes, any study of the politics of identity must therefore be informed by a careful examination of the context of racial hierarchy and its relationship to state policies. In backing up from that, what that means is that there's not a single one of us of any racial community who cannot, um, who, who must spend some time understanding the relationship of our identities and the construction of our identities with how the state, its policies have then impacted our communities deal with each other and deal with the larger nation state. It's in constant interplay and it's a form of uh, construction that is ongoing. It is ongoing, constantly shifting, but also calls on old forms. And those are the old forms that we wanna be able to talk about today. So let's offer one framework here today. And this is how Asian American racial identity is triangulated between US labor needs and US foreign policy interests. If we look at the entire history of Asians in the United States, and we look from 1650s onward, from when the first Filipino laborers jumped off of Spanish galleons uh, in the then uh, nascent United States, the relationship between how global capital, the movement of people, and specifically how US labor needs have pulled from Asia at different times has been a major underpinning for how Asians have been then constructed and therefore treated. In the first part of my remarks, we're going to talk a little bit about the earlier constructions of Asians as forever foreigners, perpetual foreigners, or the yellow peril. That's part of that early construction of US labor needs. We'll shift from there to talking about the construction of the model minority, which moved in sort of a second wave of US labor needs, needing a very different type of labor to sustain the needs at that moment. US foreign policy interests are the other uh, vector of, the, of this particular triangulation. And when I say foreign policy interests, I'm talking about the imperialist ambitions of the United States and how that has definitively and harmfully impacted particularly Southeast Asian nations as well as West Asian nations, et cetera. So we can't talk about the movement of peoples globally. Oftentimes here in the United States, we have a very uh, flat, unnuanced discourse about people come to America for opportunities. We can't actually talk about that without talking about global geopolitics, what's happening in other countries, which are push factors, and what's happening here, which are the pull factors that either create a demand around labor or create a demand because of interventionist militaristic policies in other nations. For example, in uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, et cetera. So let's hold on to that before we move into this next piece. Our earliest images that we have of labor, US Asian labor is of course, Chinese laborers who are part of the first wave to come um, and they're, of course, pushing pull factors between war, disease, and famine, particularly in southern China, but also the massive need here in the United States to implement the policies of manifest destiny and westward expansion. And I put all of that in quotes because we all learned those in our history textbooks as children without learning about how, on some levels, vindictive and harmful they were. Now, all of this the movement of Asian peoples to the United States is laid against the backdrop of the twin sins of the founding of the United States, which are the genocide and forced removal of the indigenous and native communities and the enslavement of African peoples. We can never ever talk about any one of our individual communities without actually talking about indigenous and native communities and black communities because of the deep in interlinkage between how these forms of oppression play out and also how our communities are pitted against each other. So we're gonna talk about that in a moment too. So we have these initial images of Chinese laborers who were intimately involved in building the transcontinental railroad. Very quickly, however, you move into images like this. Um, this is a political cartoon from uh, the George D. Magic Washing Machine Company depicting the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was passed in 1882. It was the most restrictive immigration act banning all Chinese at that point. At that point. And it was eventually followed by a range of exclusion acts targeting various Asian communities. 
first the Japanese, then other communities, followed by a total ban on Asian immigration by 1924. And those policies didn't change until 1965. You end up having a complete ban on immigration from Asia with a very, very narrow and small exceptions. Now, of course, we can see that the purpose of this excessively racist cartoon was to promote the company's new washing machine. Here it says, proclamation, magic washer. To all who may be concerned hereafter, no family will be out the magic washer under penalty of being dirty, kicking out the Chinese washermen, kicking out Chinese labor. And of course, the Chinese men in this picture are depicted in pretty heinous kinds of ways. I should mention, of course, a content warning. Some of the images that we're going to share are uh, provocative, they're disturbing, they're deeply racist, and they were part of a much larger socio-political underpinning to picture and caricature Asian peoples, especially Chinese and Japanese of the time, as evil, foreign, other, et cetera. All for specific ends. Now, you don't get things like exclusion acts without motivating large swaths of the population to actually think in those ways, and in particular, pitting white laborers against Asian laborers in this context. So here, you've got an example of this. Propagating violence while also solidifying racial warfare amongst workers is a major part of this project. So here it's actually called the Yellow Peril, openly and on its face, that this Chinese immigration you'll see coming out of the canister at the bottom, you see the Chinese immigrant laborers who are coming in to eat and sweep up all the jobs held by white laborers. Fostering hatred and racial division across laboring classes has been a major project of sort of the US political body um, for many, many decades. We can actually see it happening right now in every uh, phraseology that holds those people are taking jobs, whoever those people might be in that context, that's the same form of pitting communities one against another. Now, Omi and Winant, two of my favorite scholars who study racial formation theory, write, a racial project is simultaneously an interpretation, a representation, or an explanation of racial dynamics, and an effort to reorganize and redistribute resources along particular racial lines. And I want to hold on to that for a second because the act of having these kinds of racist images and racist acts, which by the way, led to the lynching of Chinese laborers along the West Coast, led to driving out uh, Chinese and Japanese communities all along, particularly the West Coast in Vancouver, in Bellingham, down through California. So there were real forms of violence that came out of this, all come from a larger political agenda as well as a visual agenda which then affects all the way through today. And it's not just because people want to um, create forms of exclusion that say, oh, those people are different. It's in order to specifically redistribute resources for the benefit of white supremacist practices. So all of this has a real reason. So the yellow peril or the forever foreigner idea that these people can never truly be American is posited from as early as the 1840s onwards in order to affect policy and the redistribution of resources. It plays all the way through. If you look at the dates of these cartoons, these are from graphic novels through the 1980s. This is 1966, 1969, 1978. And these images, of course, exist all the way to today. But even in our most favorite graphic novels, we've got Iron Man, we've got A Known Soldier, you've got the alien, the kamikaze, the brute, the lotus blossom. So all kinds of different ways that Asians are pictured and depicted through social media, through popular media, through graphic novels, through movies. So if you think about it, like any community, we are constantly consuming imagery about different entities. In this case, around Asian communities, you can think to yourself, if you close your eyes for just one moment, where you have seen the majority of images of Asians and what those images tell you about who Asians are, whether they are loyal, whether they are truly American, whether they can ever be fully assimilated, whether they're the butt of jokes. And of course, we have plenty of images to combat that, but this is a major part of the American social milieu. It leads to real harm. So we have the construction of Yellow Pearl, Forever Foreigner, Never Truly Assimilable, leading to a moment like this. And of course, many, many moments throughout, but I want to just focus on this for a moment. Uh, 110,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans in set, put in US concentration camps in, starting in 1942. Forced removal from their homes, forced removal from everything that they know, all of their property and their homes taken. And not a single one of them was ever charged with a crime. Their only crime was of being of Japanese descent. Now, I think many of you 
know that history. Um, it's become more real and more relevant on so many levels. And I do believe the Japanese American community has done an excellent job of standing up and with for other communities, particularly post 9-11 with South Asian communities, with communities that are being held in cages at the border, coming from Central and South America and Latin America and Mexico. But to think about how imagery, language, sociology, political media, and politics itself is then used to take an entire group of Americans, 60%, by the way, who were born here in the United States, to put them in US concentration camps. And we don't use the word concentration camp lightly. We use it deliberately. These were concentration camps. Now, we've set up one part of the Asian story, the way that Asians are pictured and depicted around forever foreigner, unassimilable, perpetual foreigner, yellow peril. Hang on to that for one moment. And this is, again, constructed through a variety of means. I want to switch now to how that shifts by the 1960s in some very significant ways. This takes us back to that original image of triangulation and how the US view of Asians and Asian Americans is often posited around US labor needs and US foreign policy. Thus far, we focused on the imagery and treatment of East Asians and East Asian Americans, I should mention. And of course, this pernicious forever foreigner framework affects all of us. The treatment of South Asians and South Asian Americans, particularly post 9-11, and the, the positioning of brown Asians, I being one of them, as disloyal terrorists brought severe consequences from registry lists to deportation to hate crimes resulting in murder and death. The point being that the positioning of Asians writ large as diverse and broad and specific as our community is, that positioning of Asian Americans as forever foreigners has real consequences. So I want to hang on to that. Here, I want to switch now to what happens in 1965 and onwards. 1965 is the passage of the Heart Seller Integration Act. And in that moment, we went from Asians being brought here to serve very particular hard labor needs, to work on plantations, to build railroads, and other forms of difficult labor, to a total ban on Asian immigration, to the mid-1960s with the Civil Rights Movement, and even more importantly, the US labor need of needing scientists and educated citizenry to continue the American ambition against in the Cold War against the USSR. And all of a sudden, you open up immigration from Asia with a very different type of selection of what labor force you're selecting from to then bring what we consider the second wave of Asian immigrants who are more highly educated with more social capital and more leverage. Does it mean that they're not faced with the same stereotypes and the same forms of exclusion? but with very different access to resources, many of them, not all of them, particularly because one of the underpinnings of this triangle is around foreign policy. And we cannot talk about how Asians and Asian Americans are treated without talking about the impact of imperialist war and aggression, particularly in Southeast Asia. But this broad swath of Asians that then come in post-1965 end up with a very, very different reputation, again, because of a process of deliberate selection, not because Asians are all naturally smart, but because of how the community was selected compared to how they were selected from in the 1800s onwards. Here's an example. These are two magazine covers. This is Time Magazine in August of 1987. This is Newsweek in April of 1984, both of them putting up articles about Asian Americans, the drive to excel, those Asian American whiz kids propagating a different image of Asians, which on some levels is not that unrelated to the forever foreigner positioning. It's that these people are exceptional, they set themselves apart, they are different in some way. And in this case, you may want to emulate them, whereas compared to the earlier depictions of Asians as dirty, as opium addicted, as lecherous, um, as vermin infested, this is a very different type of depiction and yet still sets this community apart from the mainstream community. Where did this mythology come from? 1966, the US News and World Report and the Wall Street Journal both write separate articles touting the hard work and success, particularly of Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans. And they coined the term, this was an article particularly by William Peterson, who coined the term model minority at the height of civil rights activism. So this is another key underpinning of the Asian and Asian American story is how our community has been positioned and pitted against 
Black and Latinx communities in a battle for supposedly scarce resources in which we are all fighting in a white supremacist melee. But this positioning is incredibly harmful on so many levels. And so many of you who work with Asian American students or faculty or staff already know this. It sets up a blanket expectation for success for Asian and Asian American students. It has no nuance for how different communities experience harm. It has no nuance for how communities experience intergenerational, intergenerational trauma of warfare, of forced migration, et cetera. But a very smartly positioned wedge tool designed at the, at the time of the height of civil rights activism that was motivated and led by Black civil rights activists and Black community members. What's fascinating, of course, that these articles that emerged in 1966 came just a year after the federal government's Moynihan Report cemented the culture of poverty theory about Black families. The idea that Black families have a cultural deficit that makes them more prone to violence, that makes them more prone to not craving education. And yet these Asians were able to achieve things that black families weren't. It's a really sick juxtaposition. It's a sick competition that, is, um, that pits our communities against each other. And it is extremely popular. It's played up by common media articles. It's played up by people in our own communities. And I'm sure many of you have talked to people in your own families who will spout the same type of rhetoric. Oh, well, our community did it. Why can't theirs? That is a fundamental act of anti-Blackness, and we need to be able to claim that and name that, and name where it comes from, that it is a created construct that benefits white supremacy if we are battling one another. I wanted to name that, and I also wanted to take a pause here. In talking about how our communities are pitted against one another, I want to talk for a moment about George Floyd, murdered by police in Minneapolis this week. And while the cop who had his knee on George Floyd's neck was white, his partner who stood by and watched and therefore is complicit was Asian American. He's specifically Southeast Asian, I believe Hmong. Part of the construction of the model minority myth that is intended to drive a wedge between black, Latinx, native and Asian communities is by promoting the idea that Asians can and will be rewarded by playing their role in a white supremacist structure. And that's not a reward that I want, or that Jade wants, or that Jonathan wants. I think that's not a reward that most of you listening want, but it is something that you can't just not want. It's something you actively have to fight against, vocally push against, be in allegiance and alliance with communities who are experiencing harm in multiple ways. In the same way that I know there are many people who are not of Asian or Asian American descent tuned in today in order to get tools to benefit your Asian and Asian American communities in your campus environments. Now, this is complicated, of course, because Jonathan, Jade, and I, just before this, were talking about ands, not ors. This is complicated because if what I'm reading is correct, that the Asian American officer is Hmong, Southeast Asian, Hmong communities face a tremendous amount of violence from police and the carceral state on so many levels, in addition to war-based intergenerational trauma. So we need to be able to hold what that truth might be, along with the fact that what does the color blue do to change everybody else's identities? That if you, if you put on that uniform, does it actually cause you to lose solidarity with communities? There can be no solidarity if we're pitted against each other or if we act in the interests of white supremacy. So I wanted to just name that for a moment and hold space for that for a second. Going back to this framework now, again, we've got Asian Americans pinned between two points around labor needs and foreign policy. This manifests as yellow peril forever foreigner typologies and being positioned as model minorities post-1965. The two, however, are in constant interplay because we might be considered model minorities, which I put all of this in giant air quotes, but when we're perceived as stepping out of line, we very quickly become yellow and brown peril again. And this is why for any of my friends and colleagues listening in today who happen to be Asian or Asian American, that holding on to model minority status won't save you. It is only through the coalition building that we do with others that we have any hope of all of our communities actually moving forward to a space of safety, health, and thriving. Um, being in this liminal, narrow space doesn't actually do anything for us. One of my favorite authors, Vijay Prashad, uh, who wrote The Karma of Brown Folk, calls it being on the treadmill to whiteness. And it's a beautiful image because if you picture, what do you do on a treadmill? You're running in place. You'll never actually get to the promised land in this case. 
of whiteness. Whiteness is a form of power, not white individuals. I'll give you one example here of how quickly model minority can change to forever foreign or yellow peril. Two of our former students, Daniel Wu and Alicia Liu, uh, wrote an op-ed about frontline healthcare workers and their need for PPE. And I'll show you, this was their op-ed in CNN. My team fights to save the sickest patients, give us head-to-toe protection. Uh, they developed a resource site to build and provide reusable PPE for healthcare workers. Just outstanding work if you're interested in supporting that. And this was one of the emails they received. Content warning up ahead. I'm gonna read it out loud. Get your self-important, filthy, reeking, sloke-eyed twats back to monkey land and eat a bowl of D. I left that part out. How quickly the pivot occurs from a lawyer and a doctor who supposedly should be living model minority lives being pivoted to this because in the context of ongoing forms of racism and inclusion, anybody who pushes back even in minute ways against the broader forms of white supremacy as they manifest ends up being treated as a foreigner. So all of this doesn't save you because the minute you step out of line, there are consequences. So we go from something like this in 1885, the Chinese quarters are the filthiest and most disgusting places in Victoria, this is in Canada, overcrowded hotbeds of disease and vice, disseminating fever and polluting the air all around, which is a reputation given to the Chinese as well as other Asian communities that they're, they're dirty and violent, again, reputation of the past, the vitriol of the past coming to the moment of today. We're at war with an invisible enemy. And as all of us know, Trump, was the one who called it the Chinese virus. I want to mention, of course, that no one is exempt from this. If any of you have seen Biden's attack ad, uh, he also talks about the Chinese, the Chinese, without differentiating between nation and people. There's no one who's exempt, particularly in the larger political game and political arena, from the way they choose to position communities as enemies or beneficiaries, depending on how it benefits them in that moment. In this case, as we just about move into Jade section, if we tie together all of the images that you've seen though so far, and we tie together the construction of Yellow Peril and Forever Foreigner with the shift to model minority typology, and yet how quickly those can change in just a moment, this, we're at war with an invisible enemy, brings us to the moment of today. It ties together a disease, a difficult disease to name and to heal from, it ties together war imagery, making 45 a wartime president, uh, and it also ties together the idea of a faceless enemy. And you bring all of those together and you have China looming, of course, as a world power, you end up with a context in which the room for harm and violence is huge, absolutely huge. So I want to close my section here and I'll be able to jump back in a little bit later, but hang on to those major key construction frameworks, which by the way, we just did Asian American Studies 101 in like 22 minutes. So I know that that is a broad overview. Take with it what you can because it is really important to understand the socio-historical and political constructions of how our community comes to be in the context of today as we move into Jade and Jonathan's section. I'll be advancing slides for both of them. Thanks so much, Sumi. Uh, so we are going to take a look, uh, kind of grounded and rooted in that socio-historical perspective. What's happening today, um, you know, policy-wise as it relates to Asians and Asian Americans um, and the coronavirus. So if you could advance the slide, Sumi, you'll see um, that the NBC News reported this um, on April 16th. So this was about a month into shelter in place and stay at home orders were in effect across the country. And, and this is no surprise, right? Federal agencies are doing a little about the rise in anti-Asian hate. No one's surprised. You could substitute basically anything related to coronavirus after federal agencies are doing little and it would, it would apply, right? I think we all are feeling that sense of frustrating frustration. I think what's, what's Further more frustrating is that the CDC and the DOJ work to stop bias incidents and hate crimes following the SARS outbreak and the 9-11 terrorist attacks. So there is a protocol in place, we're just not activating it, right? 
Um, and this was the case, again, this was reported back on April 16th. And what do we know about systemic racism when we're not actively fighting against it? Racism will prevail. And so if you flip forward, forward to the next slide, Simi, and, and it will manifest in myriad ways, right? So this uh, is a quote from Senator Tom Cotton. Uh, who proposed restricting Chinese students from studying science and, and technology at U.S. universities. And let me just read this out. If Chinese students want to come here and study Shakespeare and the Federalist Papers, that's what they need to learn from America. They don't need to learn quantum computing, right? So I'll let that sink in a little bit. If you're reading this without kind of the contextual knowledge of Asian and Asian American history that we kind of just got a crash course through, right? Someone might not readily recognize this as racist, right? Um, and, and certainly not understand how deeply rooted it is in uh, yellow peril or the tropes of model minority, right? With that, the quantum computing reference, right? Um, or the forever foreigner, right? They don't need to be here, right? How often are people making this distinction between Chinese and Chinese American students? And, and in all of the incidents happening now, does that matter? And what we're seeing is no, it doesn't, right? So this is just one tangible example of how anti-Asian racism is fanning the flames for exclusionary immigration policy um, that's likely gonna impact, um, you know, if you're like USC, you have a, a significant uh, international student population for us, is um, primarily from India and China, um, you know, what are the different ways that those communities are going to be affected as, um, as this change is being considered by the administration? Uh, I, I anticipate, um, I was checking it this morning, and it looks like there hasn't been an official release, but there's at least going to be some kind of restriction on the H-1B uh, visas and likely on the optional practical training program, and that's, of course, um, the extension of foreign student visas after graduation. So, something to keep an eye on right uh unless you're looking for this news it's probably not going to pop up on your feed right and i think that's another um challenge with any of our um asian and asian american issues is that you know so much of of these kinds of real ramifications are buried and not lifted up uh, eventually and we can go to the next slide Simi. thanks the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights would agree to demands by a group of Senate Democrats who called on the agency to take, quote unquote, robust action against increased acts of racism towards Asians. Um, the commission told lawmakers that they had voted unanimous, unanimously to address anti-Asian racism and xenophobia amid the pandemic and issue guidance to federal agencies on how to prevent it. Um, so that was reported back on May 14th. And then just last week, uh, here's a picture of Senator Kamala Harris um, introducing uh, a resolution uh, 580 condemning the Chinese virus as racist, right? So I wanted to lift up two positive examples, right? However latent, <laughs> um, but the commission's report, you know, it, it names specifically, and this is a quote from it, widespread concerns about discrimination impacting Asian Americans in relation to education, employment, hate crimes, health, housing, and immigration enforcement, right? And so usually what we're seeing on the social media is like um, things happening in the street, right? Um, but there's also these other widespread implications that could affect um, the security of our Asian and Asian American communities. Um, and I thought that this was a good example to lift up um, of a key, you know, key leaders in our US government using their positionality to amplify and address this issue. So this was um, with Senators Kamala Harris and uh, Elizabeth Warren and of Massachusetts and Maisie Hirono from Hawaii. All right, so as we know this happening kind of on the national level um, and we anticipate you know, this happening on our own campuses, if it hasn't already, um, whether that be in person or virtually this fall, the question for us to ask ourselves is, if we could go to the next slide, Simi. how is your campus ready to combat anti-Asian racism, right? So originally I had this as, is your campus ready to combat anti-Asian racism? <laughs> Anticipating the question, the answers were likely no, I amended it to, how is your campus ready to combat anti-Asian racism? And uh, for this next section, Jonathan and I are kind of gonna go back and forth and talk about um, some different strategies we can implement um, to do this. So whether we're talking about the 30,000 foot view or the on the ground perspective, 
let's first also anchor and center our student needs um, and especially our Asian American and Asian student needs. And I'll hand it off to Jonathan for a couple of slides here. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Simi. Uh, Simi, you can go to the next slide. So um, we have documentation, we have data, and it's, it's frustrating and heartbreaking at the same time for me as an educator within student affairs and in USC to have to counsel and advise and talk with students who are facing these real attacks based on their identity. Um, Stop AAPI Hate, um, which is run by one of our community organizations here in LA, APCON, um, has documented over 1,700 incidents of verbal harassment, shunning, and physical assaults, on, including on-campus incidents. And this is just since they started reporting. And it's not, it, I think this is in uh, early May that they had this. And so what we're seeing is real effect on students here on campus. Um, and what that means is a variety of things. But what we're also seeing is faculty are actively using terms like Wuhan virus, Chinese virus, and shunning students because they look Asian in classroom spaces. Um, there are Zoom bombing incidents, and we hear this a lot. And Sumi and Jade and uh, Race Center Center put on a great webinar about Zoom bombing and how to uh, manage that. But incidents with racist and sexist language in class, and even in student organization meetings, we had one incident in a Filipino American organization meeting where Zoom bombers came in um, and just completely uh, shifted the tone of the class, the educational setting, the student organization meeting. Um, we also have incidents of peers using harassing and racist language in class, group meetings, and even in private messages. So while we're all celebrating being on Zoom and being able to use technology, it's very hard for us to manage private messages. It's very hard to manage group meetings that we are sending our students into where they're having to understand how to manage these real attacks based off their identities from peers that they have to work with now. And so a lot of this, in, a lot of this ends up being work on the students, um, their peers, and also for us to have to think about how do we manage these um, incidents? How do we also create opportunities to um, understand what student needs are? So our next slide, I want to share something um, that's near and dear to my uh, work. Uh, so this is just a quick picture. Um, I don't think they knew that I was going to share this picture. Um, but we did a we were in a Zoom call, this is a, a weekly staff meeting that we had with my students um, in APAS, and we decided to try to create a heart um, to share with uh, USC and the rest of student affairs, just to not only have something fun to do, but also just kind of demonstrate the resilience that we have, especially trying to stay afloat during this time. Um, as a director, as, as a educator, as a leader, I'm particularly mindful of their health and well-being. Um, working in an Asian American center, working um, to support Asian American Pacific Islander students at, at large in the community, I think is a very difficult space to be in now that we never thought that we would have to manage. And coming from Sumi and coming from Jade, it's not helpful that our administration, that folks out there are creating these divisions um, based on identity. And students, what they're asking for across the U.S., and we're looking at documentation um, from student groups, from um, recommendations and lists of demands and letters that they're sending to the administration, they want more communication. They want more recognition of what's happening. Uh, they want a more centralized response. And we'll dive in a little bit deeper. Uh, Jade will start with the institutional levels response, but a more centralized response from the institution. We want to see how folks can access individual and also community support for an overall or an overall desire for culture change as well. Um, we have to be able to be open, reflective, action driven um, in our conversations with each other because as we are sitting here and as we are thinking about these opportunities, what does it mean for us to have Asian and Asian American individuals within our classroom spaces, within our, as colleagues um, who are taking the time and sometimes this invisible burden that they don't, we sometimes we don't understand or know that we're taking on upon ourselves um, as we counsel, as we advise, as we just exist and live in our lives. Um, we have stories of students being fearful of going out to go get groceries and what that means to them. And we just want them to be students sometimes. We just want to allow them to be available. 
So we, while we also lean on our student leaders to give us insight to student voice, we need to be mindful um, on how much time and energy we take from them. But proud moment for me to be able to sit with my students and my staff um, and just to be exist um, and to think to to talk to our administration to talk with folks about what we're doing here. Um, Jade will continue now with uh, what institution level engagement looks like. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I just want to mention that we're getting a lot of good questions in our Q&A and we are going to um, probably save them for the end and just get through the, the next few of our slides here so that it's not too disjointed. Um, it's been a little hard to, to keep up with the questions as we're going along, but thank you so much for, for your engagement and we're definitely going to um, circle back to them. Um, so I want to jump into uh, getting ready, all levels, right? So where, wherever you sit in your institutions or organizations, here are some different things you can be doing on the institutional department on program and, and of course on the individual level. We could slide forward, Simi. We're gonna talk first about the institutional level. Proactive messaging, we know this. Do we do it? No, we usually wait for something to happen and then send out something reactively, right? Condemning some vague incident that we're not gonna name happened, right? But <laughs> we're encouraging everyone to, you know, most universities um, I've seen have some kind of COVID-19 website up already to communicate other um, important information and announcements. Does that website have any statement condemning anti-Asian hate and racism as we're, you know, preparing for, for the fall? Do you provide links to report bias incidents? Do you have a bias incident protocol? Um, can you develop that if you don't have one already? Uh, and also providing links to any mental health support services for students or staff or faculty who might be dealing with anti-Asian hate. And in a similar way to provide links to, to resources um, specific to impacts experienced by other communities too, right? That should also be named because the impact is felt differently, right? So when we, take the safe route of, of not naming specific communities, we're also watering down the, the very um, highly tailored and needed support that our different communities need, right? Whether there's a big difference between helping someone through trauma and helping someone through vicarious trauma, right? So if we're not being specific in what resources are available, the likelihood of them being accessed and accessed effectively is just gonna go down from there, right? Um, if you're getting ready for a fall welcome letter, any kind of welcome letter, are we including any kind of, um, you know, mention obviously of coronavirus and how it's affecting your campus, but naming specifically that anti-Asian hate or racism will not be tolerated, right? Um, and making a direct reference to the historical, the systemic, and the institutional racism um, that currently exists on campus, right? I think there's this, this need to save face, <laughs> if I can apply an Asian American uh, <laughs> uh, concept to uh, institutional communications, right, that we don't want to air our dirty laundry, right? Um, but it's not news to anyone, right? Like, we know this, it's rooted in, in scholarship and research, our campuses are racist unless we undo it, right? And so how can we do that without actually naming it? And so these are just some ideas about how to do that through some proactive mess messaging at the institutional level. Let me pause there and see if any um, of our participants have good examples of proactive messaging that has gone out specifically related to um, anti-Asian racism or anti-Asian hate. I tried to look for one as an example for you all and I could not find one, um, unfortunately. But if, if anyone has anything, please do drop it in the chat box. What I like to do uh, after uh, our session is over is I actually go through the chat box and I kind of theme things and group them um, uh, and, and turn it into a resource for others. So anything that's shared there uh, will be shared and saved again, saved and shared again uh, in our kind of follow-up materials to this workshop. So, so thank you for, for any, any resources that, that you can share there is, is appreciated. Okay, next institutional level is disaggregating data wherever possible. So Sumi, if you could advance the slide, right? So not just having Asian as a category or Asian American as a category, but actually disaggregating and breaking it out by ethnicity. So whether this is in your admissions um, or enrollment, uh, you know, can you, can you get that data disaggregated? Um, or also in your bias incident reports, is that data disaggregated or your counseling center usage? 
these are some very powerful ways that we can set up structures for us to have a better um, track on trends and inform our responses, right? So we want to be proactive. We also want to set up the infrastructure to continue to be reactive as necessary throughout the school year because this isn't going away, right? We don't know when the end of this is going to happen. Um, the end of this, meaning uh, this this era of the pandemic, and and as long as it's going on, so is anti-Asian uh, hate and racism. So uh, we need to be we need to be prepared for the long run here. Um, so before I move on back to Jonathan, I want to see if there are any examples that participants have of institutional level um, strategies for combating anti-Asian racism on your campuses that you've been employing already, um, that you plan to, that something I said made you think of. Uh, if you could drop something in there, that would be wonderful too. Let me just take a minute to scroll some good articles that folks have put in here. It looks, like, it looks oh. like a Screen sharing one of them. Is that what I'm doing? No. <laughs> um, we have we have a number of universities that have some proactive messaging out there, which I um, am grateful for. And so I think folks can definitely take a look at them. Excellent. You know, one of the ones this is fascinating to me. One of the ones that our colleagues have shared is by is from uh, University of Iowa. It's the Pan Asian Council statement, and of mm. course, it's a it's a really well written um, specific nuanced statement and of course my I, I'm both pleased to see that and also I want to see it come from higher levels of the institution not from the Pan-Asian Council does that make sense folks that constant tension and push and pull mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. great all right so you're seeing some great um, sharing happening in the chat box so thank you all for that um, I'll hand it over back to you Jonathan and get the rest of this yeah thanks Jade so keep on inserting your links into the chat box. Again, what Jade had mentioned is that we're gonna collect this and we'll send out the transcript as well so you can kind of get the information, all the links that have been shared. We really appreciate it. Um, at the department or the program level, we kind of broke it out to um, a number of different areas that we can definitely see um, change being made, um, especially when we think about Asian American or anti-Asian, anti-Asian or anti-Asian American discrimination or racism. And at the, at the program and developmental level, um, these are often direct services and support areas that students commonly interact with. While the institutional level sets the policies and practices, it may send out a, a welcome letter or update the website. When a student actually interacts with members of these areas, it can, it can make or break their experience with the universities at times. Um, whether it's positive or negative, how these interactions can happen um, is critical for us to start understanding as folks in higher ed or student affairs. Uh, within admission enrollment centers, Jade touched upon, how do we actually disaggregate data and actually share that out with folks? It's not more than just there our annual kind of report of our first year students or our facts and figures on our website and who's here, but how do we share it and actually utilize this data in important ways to inform our stakeholders, um, whether internally or externally. I know there's sometimes concerns on how we share data and what that means. We can do it in an internal manner that still benefits um, the work that's being done at the university level. Um, we have to also understand what are the current and new international students from Asia and the implications of the immigration policy. What does that mean? I think I hold there's complicated feelings of how we use necessarily um, students from Asia to supplement our STEM fields and our graduate students and potentially not always at the appropriate levels of um, of support, but also they're, they're critical parts of our university as well. We, we have to think of them as individual students and how we can still support them. When we think about academic advising or career advising teams, how are we training our advisors to recognize and to support Asian and Asian American students? How are we recognizing how their race, their identity development, and how racism has affected them and their experiences? When we think about the common interactions with advisors specifically, some universities have mandatory advising or have open advising for all. And so sometimes this is the only staff member that our student sees on a regular basis. And so advisors recognizing the centrality of race as an identity and how in this time when we're doing Zoom advising op options and opportunities, what does it mean? How do we check in with students? How are we talking in active and proactive ways? Um, how are we start? How are also we? How are we also establishing a 
uh, learning networks for advisors to share with one another. What are our national organizations doing, but what are internally our um, universities doing to help su support our advisors with COVID-19 related issues, um, with issues surrounding anti-Asian, Asian American um, bias and incidents, and also how do we start reporting these things? All of our advisors should be able to know what are those reporting structures look like? Because if a student, sometimes we empower the student to report, but sometimes we have to take that um, ownership on ourselves to help that student report because it's important for us to know. Especially difficult, I think, on many of our campuses, how does canceling psychological services function? Um, especially in a time when we are transitioning online, um, telehealth medicine is a big component of our work. Um, but are there opportunities to expand this? I know that we um, at USC have expanded um, this idea of group counseling um, or healing circles for our international students, which has been a great success um, for many of our students because it's one, a lower risk point of access. That this idea of counseling and idea of um, psychological services sometimes is a difficult um, conversation to have with some of our students, especially if you're international or uncomfortable or don't know. How are we establishing lower risk points of access for these students? Um, how are we also designating the counselors that are best equipped to support Asian and Asian American students um, and determining ways to connect with students, not just waiting for students to connect with us, but how are we re outreaching and connecting with them? Um, and designating those counselors is an important way to understanding um, who can students find support and trusted <clears throat> and what does that look like, um, especially when they're dealing with potentially in-class um, incidents or peer-to-peer -peer incidents or, or incidents with faculty. That's a very difficult navigate, uh, way to navigate. A lot of our students have to understand that power structures exist when you have a faculty research lead and you are a junior researcher or a junior faculty member, and what does that look like um, in your future, especially if you're international, especially, especially if you're hoping to uh, stay in the United States. Um, and our counseling center can help with that. Um, and then also, how do we send out response teams? Um, we have these opportunities, I think, when we see and hear of incidents happening, immediately creating a response team to go into that class, check in with the students, make sure the faculty has the support they need and the resources they need to ensure that what needs to happen, especially following a Zoom bombing incident, let's say, or an incident within a class, um, whether we use diversity officers or a counseling center or our leadership, how can that be shaped in a way that's important? We love in the chat to also think about what are other departmental program level specific engagement opportunities? Have you done, have you seen, do you wish to do? Um, to address these uh, incidents. Um, I do want to share another picture. So I'm happy that Jade and Sumi got to let me share my pictures. So the next slide is actually um, something that we were able to work with our university president, um, president office to engage our student, especially our student workers, with both, with both our uh, university president, uh, Dr. Fault, and then our Vice President of Student Affairs, Winston Chris. Um, and they did an e-visit with us through Zoom. And it was special for the students. It was something that you know, my staff weren't invited to, which we were okay with, because we wanted time for the students to interact with folks that they might not have interacted with at a high level. But what was, what was evident from that meeting was how much care um, these administrators showed the students, that they're seeing this uptick in anti-Asian American and anti-Asian sentiments. And they're hearing these stories and they wanted to check in specifically with our students. And they think this is something small, does not take a lot of time, but if you can do, um, offer those opportunities. I also completely understand that not all campuses have an APAS. Not all campuses have an Asian American center or Asian, Amer Asian American Pacific Islander Serving Center that you can kind of quickly collect students together, student leaders together and have those opportunities. And so as we're talking about this, what are identifying the student organizations, the leaders on campus, faculty and staff, um, who might be leading affinity groups or might be, be leading research departments that are Asian American, how do we connect with those groups? Because they exist, all campuses. If you have a strong enough Asian American population or community, those groups exist somewhere. We need to identify them and be able to serve them quickly. I'll pause here. Is there any 
from our team, was there anything from the departmental program level that Just continue to see some good sharing in the chat yeah. box. So thanks for that, folks. We're going to have that. some good resources after this. Yeah, I love this resource sharing. Um, and we do see your Q&As as well. We have a lot of open ones, so we'll get to them soon. At a more individual level, um, I think there are several things that we can do as leaders, as colleagues, and for ourselves. Um, as we consider what learning engagement looks like, we have to consider what staff and faculty training and what resources are out there for staff and faculty what student leader training looks like. We all are gonna be having RAs, the orientation leaders. Many of them are being trained right now in an online module. Um, what does our training look like? How are we incorporating more of these opportunities to talk about race and racism, anti-Asian, anti-Asian American uh, incidents within these trainings? And then how does co-curricular program look like as well? Um, and so I'm gonna go into detail a little bit more but I'd love for you all to think about at an individual level, what can you do for yourself? What can you do as a leader? What can you do for your colleagues or your students that can make an impact on a more, one, more individual level, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a small group setting? Um, and so when we think about race, Simi, you can go to the next slide. Jonathan, can I jump in yeah. just for one second? Because there's a great question that came in on the chat that, that ties directly to the staff and faculty training question. Oh, yeah. and for faculty, and we have great data and evidence from across the nation that a key place that students are experiencing microaggressions and other forms of exclusionary harm of every background is in the classroom, right? And that's because the vast majority of faculty go through incredible PhD programs that teach them how to be experts in their field, but offer them no pedagogical resources. The vast majority of PhD programs do not teach professor how to teach. That's not a knock against our faculty friends, but a fact of the matter. And so we have faculty across the nation who are working on inclusive pedagogy strategies and those who will need to be pushed to include those. So to navigate the question that someone raised about how do you deal with free speech or academic freedom questions, I think this comes down to the number one, the mission of the institution. If teaching and learning is any part of the mission of your institution, you have a hook and a lever by which to move this forward. It should always be tied back to the mission of the institution, the program, the department. Number two, this comes back to teaching outcomes as well, right? So if we actually expect all of our students to perform well to the best of their abilities to achieve equitable outcomes, especially by race, ethnicity, and other factors, including first-gen status, then we actually have to use tools to meet students where they are rather than creating forms of harm in the classroom. So much of that, I think, you know, from, from my work on working with inclusive pedagogy with faculty across the country is when the flip gets switched about, oh, this is about me being a more excellent teacher, not about quote unquote lowering standards, not about quote unquote PC culture, blah, 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 but rather that we are enabling a learning environment in which students can functionally learn, this can hopefully open a conversation, that this is a requirement of 21st century pedagogy. Just wanna throw that out there for a second. I love that, yeah, thanks. Um, Cindy, I see your link. If everyone checks that link there, uh, I holla back and I believe Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Um, I believe that's the other organization, I might be wrong. Um, they're doing a two-part bystander intervention training, um, which I think is great for us if you are interested in bystander intervention. The second part is actually a de-escalation training. So how do you actually de-escalate um, when you are in a race-based race, race -based incident, or you're, you're in one or you're viewing one? Um, so as we think about the individual level, I think tying it together, what Sumi and Jade have been talking about, um, you can go to the next slide, sorry. What race and racism looks like in our trainings, how we can talk more about race and racism, um, in our conversations about race. Uh, race can be an empowering topic. It can be something that's uplifting, community building. I love talking about race. I love talking with my students about learning about themselves and who they are as individuals. Um, but we also have this larger context that US, the United States society is um, a white supremacist racist society as well, um, that our founding has been has been based on this. And so, as Sumi has talked about the three ways and the three themes, and we gave you a very, very quick overview, and we all encourage you all to take more time to learn. I think for folks, especially Asian American folks and Asian folks at this time, it's seeing themselves within the trainings can be an affirming way of how to connect the topics together. Um, by expanding and including more narratives to shape how we recognize race as being socially constructed, 
Um, and as we mentioned before, the racial triangulation of Asian Americans and how that's intentionally created to simultaneous, simultaneously minimize the role of race overall, but also reinforce racism. So race is central to the work that we do. And it should be central to the trainings that you are doing, especially those diversity trainings that you might be sending your RAs to, your orientation leaders to, or even your staff and faculty to. Um, unfortunately, I think I just saw a tweet that, you know, using our, the Minnesota Police Department, apparently in a diversity training, used Zootopia as part of their training, which is not adequate. That is not adequate at all. Um, so think more critically um, about what it can mean. And when we talk about Asian Americans specifically, um, and we talk about what it means, um, we also think about the three themes that Sumi mentioned briefly. The effects of modern minority myth, the effects of perpetual foreigner myth, um, and the effects of pan-ethnic grouping. And so where these can be, we can bring up topics of othering, marginalization, silencing, um, about anti-blackness, what orient orientalism looks like, um, and that othering piece and why, why difference um, is created in a certain way. How we fold these things in into our race and racism topics is important. And lastly, on a more individual level, also how to support ourselves. And so um, as we start wrapping up, um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, how are we using Asian American voices and narratives in our trainings? How are we positively supporting students? Um, refraining from minimizing or dismissing their incidents? How are we checking with them and also checking in with ourselves? How are we building support networks and understanding how students can be a part of our, or students can have us as part of their support network? So support network, map, support network mapping is a great tool to use in understanding what is immediate around you, what is, um, what is surrounding you, and what is you know, on the outside of the university that can support students. And then also just recognizing the effects of discrimination, including microaggressions, the effects of pain and hurt, anger, stress, battle fatigue, um, self-doubt, poor academic performance, poor, poor health outcomes, anxiety, depression. Um, those are all things that are being experienced currently by our students, our staff and faculty. And I'll pass it off to Cindy to end it up. You're muted, see me. There, you <laughs> there you go. And folks can still see this? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So actually, I just want to flip back for one second. I, I can't, I really just want to double down on this, that we are seeing violence occur in many ways. We've seen incidents of uh, a, an Asian woman having acid thrown on her, on her stoop in Brooklyn. Um, she has burns all over her body all the way to, of course, uh, the total minimization of the real experiences of our Asian American students, faculty, and staff, right? The replacement of someone's reality with your own is a micro-invalidation coming out of Daryl Wing Sue's research, right? And this is critically important that all of these are part of a larger continuum and a spectrum of violence that impact all minoritized communities. Of course, today we're honing in on the way it specifically plays out for Asian and Asian American communities. But I wanna hold on to this, that these frameworks play out for so many of our communities. And again, every time these are manifest, both physical and overt forms of violence, as well as more micro forms of violence, they are always calling upon the historical and socio-political underpinnings that lead to a way that a community has been constructed through the US racial project. And we could do the same exercise for Black and African American communities, for Indigenous and Native communities, for Latinx, Latino and Latina communities, for Arab and Arab American communities. We could do this, the same exercise about construction leads to forms and patterns of exclusion and treatment that then lead to harm. And it's our job as educators to proactively address that harm in specific and nuanced ways while also developing the keys key skills to see how those forms of oppression are closely and tightly interlinked. None of us are liberated without each other, and we cannot say that enough, the three of us, and I know many of you feel that same way. Let me add, of course, that one of the things for us as educators and as Asian Americanists is that we are deeply uh, immersed 
in reading about our community as it continues to evolve, of course, via Twitter, Twitter, but also through scholarly media as well, where there's so many sources of information. Um, and this is, it's, and it's an exciting time, actually, to get this level of information. I just wanted to mention three different titles that you could possibly add to your collection, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in Higher Education, focusing on the underserved immigrant, refugee, and indigenous Asian American and Pacific Islanders in higher education. And this is an oldie but a goodie working with Asian American college students it's from 2002. It's still hot, y'all. It's still hot. Big ups to all the folks who wrote that back in the day, and it still plays. So again, just three options to add to your own collections to continue your own learning. Um, as we get close to the end of our time, of course, share all of our contact information here. I'm going to stop the share so that you can see all of us and we can try to answer a couple of your questions in the last few remaining moments. We've really enjoyed having you in the space. We're so appreciative of all the resources and links you've shared. We will share all of that back out to you in a condensed, cleaned up form within the next couple of days. Let me stop the share in the meantime so you can see us. Hello, everyone. And Jade and Jonathan, if you want to unmute yourselves and we can try to tackle a couple of these questions. Um, easy question. Sumi, what was the book that you mentioned about the treadmill to whiteness? Oh, uh, the author is Vijay Prashad, P-R-A-S-H-A-D, in The Karma of Brown Folk, which is sort of a call and response to W.E.B. Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk. Perfect. Thank you. Um, let's see. Earlier questions. Um, Sumi, you brought up a good point about modern minority versus perpetual foreigner. How do you recommend we talk with our Asian American friends who deliberately, deliberately or unknowingly have brought up um, this idea of merit, I would say, um, that makes them immune to this, that gaining, gaining status, degrees, money, jobs, status, whatever it is, um, makes them immune to all of this? Mm. Well, we provided one very minute example of our own former students, Alicia and Dan, who are exempt exemplary lawyer and emergency room doctor not exempt from this in a moment of hate. Right? There's nothing that makes us exempt because the American Racial Project is founded, number one, on othering, on genocide and enslavement, and these are all intimately linked to how capitalism functions. If we can't name that, we are part and parcel of the problem and end up being complicit. But let me pull back from that because the vast majority at, at our community, our community writ large, over 65 different ethnicities under this vast pan-ethnic umbrella is still over 65% immigrant. So our community is constantly developing its own frameworks and its own understanding of itself vis-a-vis -vis who we are positioned in triangulated ways in the American racial hierarchy and in the American labor hierarchy. So let me give one great example. I actually feel one of the programs we run out of Asian Pacific American Student Services is called CIRCLE, Critical Issues in Race, Class, and Leadership Education. And CIRCLE fundamentally is a seven-week program that aims to essentially deprogram students from the mythologies that they've imbibed about being exceptional Asian Americans who will benefit by being model minorities, who have no vested interest in coalition building. Um, and over seven weeks, it really um, helps students to understand their positionality better. And I would say any program we can create or find like that for the adults in our lives, is incredibly meaningful and powerful. And those come through conversations, through examples. Jade mentioned the OPT and H1B cuts that are coming along the way. The language used around that, here's a great example. The language used around that said, oh, in order to protect people who are losing their jobs, we're gonna cut OPT and H1B. It is different groups of people losing their jobs in this, in this moment. It's not OPT and H1B people who are taking the jobs that are being lost but the whole narrative of us being pitted one against the other is a constant. So I think the other big piece of this is how do we actually help the people in our closest circle learn to read the narratives? And that's a lifelong skill that has to be learned. But how do we get them to sort of open up from the matrix essentially and say, oh, we are cogs in a capitalist wheel. That takes mm -hmm. time, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. As we end, maybe one final question could be, how do we navigate institutional policies, limitation barriers, whether at a high level, at a departmental level, at an individual level, how do we navigate those to make changes to support Asian and Asian American students and faculty and staff at that point too, I think. Go ahead, 
I, yeah, thanks for picking that up. There, there were some similar questions about, you know, if you are not the institutional leader of your institution, right, how do you get the message up <laughs> um, to do something like proactive messaging? And I always come back to, you know, re reinforcing Sumit's point that it, it's complicated and it's over time, right? There's no silver, silver bullet. There's no quick answer. If, if we had one, we would have shared it in our PowerPoint with you all. <laughs> but that being said, I think that, um, sharing that you attended this this e-learning um, opportunity and sharing a link to the PowerPoint and the resources could be an entry point to a conversation, right, as an example. Sometimes it's just about asking the question and it moves different wheels throughout throughout the, the bureaucracy um, and, and shakes up the status quo a little bit, right, and gets people to start thinking differently, right? Even if it's the data question, right? Um, is your data disaggregated? Can I see this disaggregated um, by Asian ethnicity, right? It's not is there a, I hate to use this word, but is there a non-threatening way to, um, to kind of approach um, the issues that we, we more directly want to address um, if we anticipate uh, resistance or, or backlash from, from our colleagues within our institutions, right? It's not yeah. just institutional racism existing in the structure, right? That, that there are people still reenacting it, right? Yeah. And, and upholding it, right? And that's real. Uh, and these are people that we're working with, right? Um, so that's just a, a couple of cents yeah. if anyone wants to jump in. I think, I think we're also lucky that we do have great colleagues, researchers, individuals out there who are doing excellent work that we can base these answers that we're setting up mm -hmm. the chain, say, here's a bunch of research that also says and reinforces what I'm talking about. And so how do we start looking at those who are writing about this, researching about it, looking at institutional policies and practices? If we take data disaggregation, there's a plethora of information about data disaggregation now that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago necessarily, mm -hmm. that we can start looking at, this is important for us to understand who is here, that we can't just treat all Asian and Asian Americans alike, even though the institution and society and structurally, they are all being treated alike. And that functionally as, as race as an identity or racism as an identity is, is constraining them in that. Um, so yeah, I think maybe what we can offer is that we, if you have more questions, you can, email us, let us know. Um, we Definitely do see a lot of the question know. answers, yeah. What, I, what we do too, just so you all know, there, there's a lot of um, chat box um, chatter, not, not with everyone, but even just to the panelists. So I kind of go through and, and uh, make themes out of it and we'll answer any questions mm -hmm. in our resources document we'll send out later, um, probably uh, by next week um, that we weren't able to address in this time with you all together here live, so. Well, it has been a pleasure to have all of you here with us. Uh, we are um, delighted and energized that so many of you, over 450, chose to participate in today's conversation. I think Jade and Jonathan made some crucial points here that we don't hold on to this information here. As you receive all the resources, we designed it so you could share them as widely as you want with your colleagues, your friends, homies, people you don't even like, whatever you need to do to get the information out there to serve our communities, our students, faculty, and staff better. And to always remember that these are interlinked conversations. Um, we are always here for you. You have all of our contact information. Thank you so much on behalf of the USC Race and Equity Center, as well as USC Asian Pacific American Student Services for joining us. Take good care of yourselves. We are holding you. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you all.